we uh, were invited for a competition for uh, this project, the Rothschild Bank in London in 2005. And the project in our company is still called Bank because at that time it was a confidential project. Nobody was supposed to know about, you know, how these things go. And until today we call it Bank. Um, we were quite intrigued about this comp uh, competition and we were quite desperate to win the competition. So we worked very hard to get it. But at the same time, I have to say, we were also quite surprised to get this commission because uh, uh, banking uh, dynasties are in normally quite uh, conservative and I was not really sure if we would fit into that thing. But anyway, I'm going to show you now how we resolved that and how we came to terms together on this. Uh, this is the location. Um, you know, a uh, bank is uh, situated in the, uh, uh, let's say, the old, old uh, financial city center of London, what you all call here the city. It's surrounded by many monuments. And, um, and at the same time, it's embedded in a kind of a medieval uh, street pattern where the streets are quite often not wider than three and a half meters. So I show this is in Swiffens Lane. And what you see here is actually the um, entrance to the former Rothschild building on the right side. So here you can see, we couldn't, Rema me, we couldn't believe our eyes that the main entrance to such an institute was just a small lane where only a black cap could fit. This is the old building they were in. And this was their entrance to the old building. Uh, the family is, uh, it's a German, a Jewish family. Um, uh, they came from Frankfurt. Uh, uh, this is the first, uh, the house where they started their business. Uh, it was called as uh, Rote Schild, uh, and therefore the name Rothschild, in case somebody speaks German here and here. Um, and he uh, decided that his five sons would, send, would be sent into Europe to develop business. And here you see the map to the cities where he sent from Frankfurt all his uh, sons. And Nathan was sent to London to start setting up business there. This was the first building on the same plot as we actually built the current building where he started his business. And this was the second one, a bit larger. Um, and this is, but meanwhile, of course, it's, uh, it's quite a large company with uh, settlements all over the world. It's not like uh, they own the whole countries, but the red dots <laughs> represent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to impose that tonight. But anyway, the red dots imply where their offices are. And their main headquarter is still in uh, London. So here you see what happened over time. Uh, the organization grew so much that they didn't fit in their building anymore in St. Fivens Lane. And they had to lease a lot of buildings around uh, that building in order to uh, deal with the amount of space that they need. And of course, they had when they gave us the, um, this project or this commission, they of course were quite tempted to get all the people together back in one building. This is a kind of indication how much the organization grew. Uh, looking at the site, uh, we found of course uh, during the competition period already that there's quite a few treasures. Uh, there is a quite important church uh, was behind the existing building. Here in front you see the existing building and there the church. It's a Wren church. It's from the same architect as St. Paul's. This is the backside of the church. And this is the interior of the church. And this church was actually over time uh, blocked. Uh, it once had a very direct relationship with the city, as you see on the top left uh, image. But over time, like many places in London, it got totally cluttered and, you know, built full built buildings. So the whole relationship with the city and the church actually disappeared over time, including the last building that was really placed, as you can see here. Uh, the last building frontally blocked the whole relation with that uh, churchyard. 
So this was actually what happened over time. So all the historical connections and uh, streets that were actually apparent in this area were just blocked by buildings and the expansion of the buildings. Um, and of course, we, we thought we have to do something about it. Uh, and uh, it would be extremely good because it's a very busy area to reinstate these relationships. As I said, the site was not very simple. Uh, I don't know how many models we made for this project, but uh, here you see an overview. Uh, the difficulty, of course, of the project was that uh, the client uh, wanted quite a large volume on the site, but at the same time we were in heritage area. And, of course, there are very st uh, strict rules about how much volume is allowed on such a site. Of course, we were uh, outside of the, the famous viewing corridors uh, related to St. Paul's. So here on the right you see our building. But nevertheless, of course, we were quite um, constrained because of the value of all the monuments around us. Uh, here you see on the top the plan of the existing building. So you see what normally happens in London. Everybody uses every square centimeter of the site and just extrudes it up. So on the top you see the volume of the old building actually representing exactly the property line. And on the bottom is actually our kind of interpretation of that plot, how we could use the plot. And what you see here is what we try to indicate in this diagram, that we really want to reinstate this relationship with the church. This was uh, our first conceptual diagram. Um, the bank is a kind of big safe uh, with their working areas. Uh, the areas they work are highly confidential. Nobody is allowed to go in or make any photos. And to that, we, we made some kind of annexes, what we call annexes, that actually uh, create a relation of this kind of hypercube with very efficient office space to the city. So this is the concept of the building with the cube and the annexes. We have annexes on three sides and one on the top, what we call the panorama tower. In the cube, we have basically the, the generic office spaces, uh, very straightforward, organized. And in the annexes, we have either support functions for such an office, or we have specific rooms, like in a sky pavilion, where we have a panorama room. Um, I skip this. So in order to, uh, to recreate this relationship from here on the left, in Swiven's Lane and the church, we decided to lift the whole building from the ground to, to make that uh, view. So here you see the lifting it's on the ground floor. To create this view through the ground floor back to the, back to the church. At the same time, of course, the relation on the back side of the building was as important. Um, this is Here you see a model that we made. Uh, it was quite important. We tried to make a kind of twin relation between the back side of our building, construed as a kind of narrow high volume, and the church of uh, Wren. Uh, the ground floor. Um, as you can see here, so here's St. Swiffens Lane, and here's the view. And this is actually an open forecourt where you have the, the, uh, the garden of the churchyard and the church behind. And by organizing the ground floor in such a way, we could actually reinstate all these historical connections, as you can see here. So basically, you have here on the left side is the main entrance to the building, and here on the, on the right side there's another part that belongs to the building, which I will explain later. Uh, but basically, it's a quite open and loose ground floor, which is individual volumes positioned. And of course, the top was quite important. The client told us he never had a view in London. So we tried to do something about it and put a nice sky pavilion on top to create such a view. And this was then one of the images we made in the competition to indicate the kind of idea on this top room. Here's the view. The facades. Uh, the facades are... Um, the annexes have a kind of mesh facade. 
and the cube has a more open facade. For us, it was quite important. Uh, the Rothschilds were always hiding in, uh, well, hiding, I would not say hiding, but they were in London, but you could never see from the street in which buildings they were because there was never any sign on the window, not whatever, anything. And uh, so this kind of being privately and secret and at the same time being visible, we try to uh, translate into the facade. So the annexes are more private, they have a mesh incorporated in the facade, so you can't really look in, you see for uh, people, but not really clearly, and the cube is just more transparent and open. This is a very close-up image of the facade that we used in the annexes. We developed this facade with Ocalux when we did Seattle. It's an aluminum mesh which is incorporated into the glass to provide sun shading. And here, this is how it looks when you get a bit further away from the glass. So it's quite transparent, except when you get very close, but from a distance it's quite transparent. What was really important, of course, when we decided to lift this volume from the street, at the same time, of course, we had the discussions with the city if we should not emphasize at least the historical line of the street. And actually, we thought that was a very interesting idea. So in order to deal with that, we decided to take the, all the vertical columns, which are on the outside of the central group, to extend them down to the street, to create a kind of screen between the street and the open space behind. And this is how that looks in the street. So when you're far away, it's quite close. But when you get closer, it opens up to the space behind. Now here, I just want to show you some images to, uh, to show how, uh, how insane this site is to a certain point, but also exciting, of course. This is like three and a half meter distance between the existing building and our new building. This is how close we get to uh, the building of uh, Foster, which is next door. We are kissing each other. I don't know if that was... Uh, anyway. <laughs> was never the plan, but when you see the final photo of the photographer, you think, oh my god. <laughs> Here, very close. Here, this is an image from the churchyard going up. Pretty close, and this is the building a bit further away. Of course, the sky pavilion, the volume on top, gave the advantage that you can see the building somehow from a distance, but of course it's very hidden. You have to search for it. I hope you can see it. It's somewhere here on the left side. But it's there. But it's there in a very subtle way, and I think that is the nice thing about this building, that it's not like a high rise, it's not a low rise, but it's somehow a mid rise. It's somehow <laughs> doing something in between. Some more photos. This is from the back. But you can never see the building as a whole. And that, I think, is the most exciting thing about this building. It's anything uh, but the icon, because you never can see it as a whole. So you always see only glimpses of it. Anyway, we managed to get this building approved on this site, so we were all quite happy and sweating, I have to be honest. Uh, but of course, then we got to, uh, to the construction, so I'm going to show you a few uh, construction images, how wild it was on that <laughs> site. And uh, of course, we were, uh, we were quite uh, drained by uh, the client about liabilities in London. And uh, I just want to show you a short story about this. Uh, when we started the project, uh, it became quite clear that every party wall becomes a huge liability in this country. So nobody is, is daring to take any stone away, uh, sca being scared that the neighbor might claim damages. So the, the basement walls, as indicated in red here, in our first drawings, we had to draw them as one meter. So basically, the first party wall, the second party wall, and the third party wall, and the fourth party wall, we all had to leave them in, in, in place. So it, of course, was a big waste of uh, space, but because of liability, this is reality. Oh, sorry, it's the wrong way around. This was the old one, but at the end, of course, when we started building, it uh, looked all less problematic and we could uh, make it a bit thinner. 
the same time, what was really a new thing for us in uh, in London, we are of course used to work all over the planet, but normally you work in a city where you have zoning plans, and if you stay within the zoning plan, you can build whatever you want. Well, not really, but at least it's easy to build. In this country, it's very different, because first of all, you need to negotiate with the city the volume and how it looks and what it does. But then, you still have to negotiate with all your neighbors all the other issues like rights of light, uh, you know, oversailing boundary lines because you want to clean your facade, etc. So I just made a rough sketch on how many legal agreements we have on this project. Uh, but if we wouldn't have succeeded on this legal agreements, we could have never built it. So I think it's quite extreme. But anyway. Um, Later in the process, um, as also quite normal in London, uh, you know, an architect like us, they were asked to do the building, but we were not, mostly not asked to do the interiors. Uh, nor Fosse, nor Piano, all architects have that same problem. But of course, we were quite keen to do the interiors on this project, because we always saw this project as a nice interface between history and modern architecture. But anyway, uh, at, at the end, I will show you how it works, but we came up with a split. Uh, we as OMA did the representative areas and Pringle Brandon did the generic office areas. But uh, I want to start with how they were working. So these are some images of their offices as how they were. These were the generic office spaces, what I would call like this. And in the old building, they have a lot of representative spaces and they have a lot of traditional spaces. So this is one of the uh, dining, uh, director's dining rooms where you see in a it's decorated in a very traditional way with the portraits of all the people around the wall, etc. This is one, was one of their, what they call the panel room. But anyway, we didn't, we thought we have to do something with this and we have to at least find a modern interpretation of this. And of course, this was our goal. How do we uh, merge modern architecture on the right side and the history and the traditions of the Rothschilds? Um, this is just a section through the building indicating how the program is organized. Uh, everywhere where it says specific, that is what OMA did. And what is generic is what Pringle Brandon did. So we were concentrating on the main entrance area and all the meeting rooms and all the client interfacing rooms and the party rooms on the top, because that was at least our proposal. So it was nice to finish that. And this was a diagram that we made uh, to show how we want to incorporate this, uh, this heritage into the building. And uh, so we, we wanted to, at least on the ground floor, show something of this history, but also on the <coughs> top levels and in the tower. And on the generic floors, we were planning to incorporate just little touches of this kind of history. For the generic floors, uh, we had uh, uh, quite a few discussions how to organize the floor plates. Um, as you can see, the building plate is organized like a very generic multifunctional floor plate. It has only four columns, no cores whatsoever. And we have in the annexes, we have the cores and the, the toilets, kitchens, etc. And there was quite a long discussion with us, the client, and uh, Pringle Brandon on how we would organize the floor plate. Left, that was a proposal to make kind of special spaces on the floor plate, and in the middle one, we proposed to make a kind of boulevard on the floor plate from which you then go to your workspaces, which was at the end the final solutions. Of course, from these floor plates, you have fantastic views, you can see all the monuments in London, and um, looking back at, uh, at the floor plate, so here you see the boulevard, what we call the boulevard, the open a kind of boulevard when you come out of the lift. And uh, we organized the floor plate in such a way that uh, the people who actually are most working at their desks, which are mostly the people working on open plan, would at any time have an open view to the outside and the enclosed offices are only organized on two facades. This was for them quite new because in their old building, you know, people with a closed office, they have they are more important, so they take all the facades. So all the people who were working most at the desk never saw the outside world. 
So um, this was, I think, quite important. Now, this is a kind of image that shows you what their heritage entails. Uh, they have a, a large archive uh, in which they collect uh, paintings, uh, presents, etc., cetera, uh, busts uh, in, in, uh, that they collected over time. So the archive comprises of uh, uh, cash, uh, cash registers, but also, you know, paintings, but also small amulets, boost, etc. Now, this I showed you before. Um, we, of course, were quite interested in what can we do with this, uh, with this kind of uh, archive material. And here we started, uh, it was kind of first look in how we can manipulate the historical material into a kind of modern medium. Um, uh, other thing that we were quite intrigued by is, of course, uh, some kind, uh, some English traditions. Uh, there's quite a lot of upholstered walls in uh, in important buildings, and we thought it could be nice to translate that in woven metal instead. And second of all, we also decided to scale up the heritage. Instead of having a wall with like a few pictures on top, we said, okay, why don't we just make big walls and just we're going to inflate your paintings times five and we're just going to reprint it on silk or with other mediums. And also the paintings, we're just going to group them all in one place. So that the heritage is basically um, dedicated to certain areas and the rest of the interior can stay quite modern. Okay, now I'm taking you through the building, starting at the ground floor. Um, on the ground floor, we, uh, we were, uh, now going back to my travertine collection, I don't think we do a building without travertine, so here again travertine. Uh, the only thing what we did here is we took this travertine story a bit further. Uh, we wanted to do the floor in travertine as well as the complete ceiling. Uh, the ceiling is about 60 meters long. Um, now here you see our first meetings with the client where we looked at different samples. And here we were in Italy to look at the stone. These are some first samples of the stone. And of course, what is really impressive when you're in Italy and you see this kind of big uh, places where they cut all the stone blocks out is the size. The size, as soon as you start making it big, it becomes a lot more impressive than, uh, impressive than a little piece of stone. Uh, these are some first samples. At the same time, we also uh, were quite uh, intrigued by the gravestones. There are some gravestones here in the churchyard. And we somehow wanted to extend that pattern onto the travertine. <laughs> so these are some first samples of that. And here you see it, how this kind of pattern of graves. There are no graves below. There were well, probably once graves below because there was a churchyard here. But it was just an idea of us of making that link with the church stronger than it was. Now these are some images of the uh, travertine ceiling. So here you have St. Stephen's Lane, this is the drop-off area, travertine on the top, and here on the left you see the, the lobby. This is the view to the church. And this is also to show how busy it gets in St. Stephen's Lane at rush hour, the whole street is packed. Okay, back uh, to the entrance. So beside the travertine, of course, we want to do a few more things. Um, as I said before, the ground floor is split into two. The left side is the entrance to the main office building, and on the right side, we want to represent the archive. Uh, so we actually said the left side should actually be more modern, and the right side of this entrance building should be more a reference to the history. Now some of these, uh, these are some photos from the archive. Uh, this is a, an, uh, an archive that has been confiscated by the Russians uh, and they only got it back uh, two years ago. But of course the boxes are very beautiful. We were quite intrigued on it. Today somebody told me it looks like it says OMA, but it's just coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> 
In their old archive, they had a reading room, which looks uh, like this. So what, what actually happens is that people, researchers, come to their archive, research their history, and then they go back. And therefore, they want a space like that. But we thought this looks pretty boring. And uh, we actually decided to make this much more a kind of library in the sense, as you know it, in this country. In this country, you have the most beautiful libraries uh, in place. So that is what we, uh, we did. So the library is open on the ground floor. You can look into it. Of course, we screened it slightly off because otherwise I think if you sit there as a researcher, you feel you're working on the street. So on this glass window, we did a kind of pixelated uh, image of the five brothers, as you can see here. And here's a photo of that looking back. Anyway, this was the reference that we wanted to go back to. And this is how, this is a image of the design of this library. So the, the space is five meter 20 high. So we stack the books up all to the top. And these are some photos of the company who made the library. We made very fixed shelves, as you can see on the left, that is a sample of it. And we incorporated in the shelf the kind of retractable pieces, but also the lighting fixtures that you need in order to to see what, what you're reading, but you see there on the top. And this is an image of the library when it was just finished, but not completely. The books are still missing. And this is an image from the outside. On the left side, uh, oh yeah, we have as any typical office. We have the entrance here, reception counter, a lounge, and then the entry gates to the, to the lift lobby. And what we did in the in the lobby, we introduced. Uh, we wanted to introduce something soft, and we introduced actually a curtain. And the curtain can be positioned in different ways. It can be positioned like that, but it can also enclose this whole area here in the front. And that has had two purposes. First of all, to make the seating area in the lobby a little bit more private, but also when there's a large event on the top of the building, people can leave their coats here and then they just move up to lift to their entertainment room. These are some images of the, f of the curtain. This curtain is designed by Petra Blaise. And here are some views how the curtain closes and opens. And here you see that it almost creates a room within a room on the left side. <coughs> and on the core we use the woven metal material, which you see here as a close-up, which is applied in panels. And here you see how it looks on the core. Going up in uh, to the building, uh, to the meeting rooms and level 10, where we have the client dining rooms and the director's dining rooms. We had this, uh, we, f we found this image, this was from an exhibition in Paris, uh, and I think it's very beautiful. It's a kind of indicating a kind of collusion effect that you could have in corridors, in a, instead of having straight corridors. And of course, we translated this straight into heritage walls. So what we did on both floors, we incorporated a few really big walls where we re-incorporated or re-interpreted uh, their historical uh, references, as you see there on the left side. And this is done on this floor in this way. So the top is a kind of blending of an image of a, of a castle, uh, which a Rothschild castle in France, and a parliament uh, picture of, uh, which is very important for the Rothschild, because well, somebody became Lord, lord uh, in, in the House of Lords. And on the bottom, we built a very large vitrine where they could exhibit all their exquisites. So this was a sample of the vitrine. This was how it looked when it was just finished, and this is more or less how it looks now. These are the meeting rooms on the same level. They're quite modern. Uh, so you see there's always a very modern environment and on one side you suddenly have this heritage wall. These are the meeting rooms. 
The, the glass looks a bit milky because we used um, a glass that you can make completely milky because so you can you just switch on if you want privacy you put this privacy and then it goes completely opaque but in normal circumstances you can always look into these rooms when people don't require uh, things in these rooms we uh, we made also a kind of heritage panel a sliding there uh, this is walter uh, Walter liked animals a lot. He's one of the Rothschild uh, people. <laughs> and there are the most crazy photos of him in the archive. He is sitting on a turtle. And uh, anyway, some of these images we used. Uh, so we, we, we tried to <coughs> translate this image into a kind of pattern. And uh, the pattern at the end we wove into a fabric, as you can see here. And from a distance it looks like this. On level 10, which is one level higher, is the level where we have the client dining rooms and the director's dining rooms. <coughs> here we incorporated more of these walls. So here you see some references on the left side, the paintings, the timber paneling and some paintings. And this was the Colisa idea that we had, that you have the corridor and you actually have these walls, like almost like you're in a theater. It just tells you a story about their heritage. Uh, as I showed you before, there are old uh, uh, rooms were full with uh, kind of oak paneling, which uh, we thought we should translate that in a different material. So what we did, we made a collage out of this paneling and made a new image of that, and that we engraved into metal. So this is a photo of the factory where you see these plates engraved, and here you see how it looks. So this is a very close-up photo where you can see and this is how it looks in the corridor it's very it, it has a, a very nice effect because it is like a metal wallpaper which is quite exceptional <laughs> i never did a wall metal wallpaper before this is a very important uh, painting this is nathan with all his children there are a lot of them and this uh, this we manipulated and actually these are some tests where we tried to print this on silk and these are some. Uh, this is some uh, drawings we found in the archive from Madison Manor, uh, and we use the uh, architectural drawings actually to print on filt. And here you see the filting process in Germany, where the panels come out of the thing. So instead of that, we have now that. And we also hang the paintings onto aluminum wall instead of on a traditional wall. So in here you see that this level looks extremely modern and sharp, as you can see here. But then you have these kind of inserts of heritage. We also use their um, old furniture in here. And we thought it was quite exciting just to have the antique furniture straightforward including their credenzas, which are just standing uh, against the glass. And because this glass is milky, you always see a kind of shimmer of what's happening next door. Some image from the painting room. Then the roof. Uh, we, were, we had to fight quite hard to get a clean roof. <laughs> Because most buildings in London, they always have their air handling units on the roof, so therefore you can't use that space. But at the same time, it's the most precious space, I think, in such a context, because it's the only space where you can breathe, it's the only space where you have a view, etc. And uh, of course, we looked a little bit at their manners and the garden designs they initiated in, in connection with their manners. And... Um, but at the same time, we also, um, by the time we got to this design, we had so many meetings about their meeting room requirements that I thought it would be quite nice to make a roof with meeting rooms. So, and that's what we did. So it's a kind of uh, green pattern. And these kind of squares you see here, they are lunch, meeting, dining rooms in the open air. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. This is a view. And here you see how the tower is actually standing on top of this roof. And it almost feels like you have a second ground floor. You feel completely disconnected from uh, whatever happens in the city. This is a view. 
the view to the city. And then we come to the tower. The tower has uh, three levels. In order to keep the roof clean, we, had we incorporated a lot of the technique in the bottom of the tower. And on the top two levels, we have uh, meeting rooms and a panorama room. These levels are quite high. They're around five meters high. And here you can see them from the outside. And this is an excellent metric of each level. So on the left side, you see level 14, which has actually a core where the lifts come up and you have three meeting rooms. So it's quite straightforward. But on the top level, of course, we, were we wanted to reduce the core as much as possible to create this really large room with a nice view over the city. This is a view, uh, one of the meeting rooms on level 14. The sun is, is, is amazing up here in the light in the evening. We incorporated on 14 also a hidden bar. As you can see here, there's a big panel moving up. When there's an event, they can use it as a bar. Oh, sorry. I missed the photo, it didn't come. Anyway, this is how it looks, but I didn't manage to get a photo to show you how it looks when it's open. And this, of course, is the top floor. Uh, so here you come up onto the top floor. And this is uh, the space. So you have a view on St. Paul's. On the left, you see the core. And this is preparation for reception. The client really, we always saw this space as an open space. And the client said, well, we are not going to use this all the time because we have to have meeting rooms. So we had to make come up with a solution to make this room dividable. But until now, it didn't happen. There's just one event after another but here to just show you uh, how it uh, looks so this is the open space and that is how it looks if the room is up uh, divided in three rooms for a meeting and these panels that you see they're all stored in this uh, in this box there on the left side um, that wall of course that meeting room wall that you see there on the left is quite an important wall because you see it very clearly from the city and we also wanted to do something on that wall. And uh, we found this uh, very nice um, uh, architectural design for a garden for Gunnarsman Park, which is one of the Rothschild estates. And we actually took one of these elevations uh, as kind of inspiration for that wall. So this is the image we took. And now the first idea we had is to uh, perforate, uh, as you can see, to perforate the pattern into sil into uh, felt with a kind of uh, uh, copper gold uh, background. But it didn't really. Uh, we had a big sample of it, it was hanging on site, and we were like, "This is not good." Uh, it also got really dirty because people need to handle this, so we got away from that. Uh, here you see a close up, and then. At a certain point, we thought, well, maybe we should do so, uh, some embroidery. Uh, but then we went to the uh, textile museum in Tilburg, which uh, uh, is a museum that is still producing fabrics for artists. And here, this is a photo of their museum. And they weave, actually, for you custom-made fabrics. And that's what we did with them. Uh, it took a long time. I don't know how many hours we spent on this because we never wove before. It's a new technique. So here you can see all the samples we made. I think I have about 20 linear meter in my office still with samples and tests. This is a kind of close up. This is one of the first big samples of a tree. Another sample. And this is the fabric very close up. So we. As when you get very close to the fabric, you can't really see the pattern, only from a distance. And I think that was quite important for us in order to deal with the scale. And this is how the wall looks. Uh, this is not even my photo. I didn't see the whole wall because it's still in storage, because they party all the time. But I hope <laughs> in a half a year, I managed to see this finally myself. And these are so this is how it looks now. The panels are in storage, and there's not much to see. The last thing I want to show you is uh, we also worked with Irma Bohm on the signage for this building. Uh, we developed, she developed uh, a kind of what she called a stencil. So it's a kind of metal plate and the letter is actually carved out. And by doing this, if you apply the letter on whatever finish, you always see the finish, 
the finish and behind makes actually the reading of the letter. And they are quite nice. They are not uh, everywhere applied yet because they are still not finished. But um, they are a pink anodized and light blue anodized. And here you see one. But and there's some signage for the lift. That's it. indeed Ellen I wonder if we have any questions um, I do ask that you wait for the microphone so uh, how, how were you able to convince uh, the clients to do the interiors Sorry? how were you able to convince the client to do the interiors in not getting the interior so at a certain point, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to make a whole interior proposal for the whole building and just give them a book. And that triggered it. But I did, we did it, of course, at our own cost because we were so nervous and not doing this interior. So we just made the design. And they were quite impressed by the book. And therefore, we <laughs> managed to get it. But it's quite amazing because normally, when we do other buildings in Europe, we normally get the interiors and the assignment for the building in one go. And here, it felt very strange. And I think it feels anyway very strange because I think the interior and exterior of building are, they need to go together. So uh, for me, it's a it was a very strange experience that this was traditionally so split and that you had to fight for it to get it. <laughs> so it was, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, were there any implications of the uh, August demonstrations, the last August demonstrations, on the decision making regarding uh, security or the, the open ground floor that um, you proposed? No, thank God not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say we had that problem on the embassy in Berlin. We designed the embassy in uh, you know the free world where we Dutch people were in for many years until 9/11. And when 9-11 came, of course, many changes, uh, things changed on the building. Uh, you have to understand that this organization is used to this a lot. They are a Jewish bank, so they feel quite, you know, they're very uh, scared of attacks, uh, not because of demonstrations, but because they are Jewish. So I think that they are quite used in, uh, in security. I think I'm uh, they are not closing up. Uh, so it stays open as it is. Uh, it's even more open because they were doubting at a certain point if it should be all that open and if people should just walk over that drop-off lane. But until now, that goes all quite well. And um, and uh, I, I think what is nice about the building is that you do not feel the security. Uh, of course, we have the barriers to the lifts. It would have been nice not even to have them but uh, you don't really feel it. I mean, there are people standing there and walking around, but as soon as you cl get close to the building and you make a picture, of course, somebody will come to you. <laughs> I mean, I asked one colleague of mine uh, before we uh, uh, designed the ground floor entrance, I said, why don't you go around in London and, and photograph some entrances of office buildings for me? <laughs> Well, she called me three hours later back and she said that it's just an impossible task because every time I pick my camera, there's a security guy grabbing me in my back and uh, say to stop photographing. So I think the whole of London is, is a bit like that. How did you get the tower past the planners? <laughs> seduction. <laughs> I mean, that's the only thing I can say. I mean, it's all seduction, of course. Uh, I have to say, when we were at the planning meeting where they were going to approve, of course, some members said, why don't you knock off that tower, you know? But Peter Rees defended it really, really heavily, and uh, that's why the tower stayed. Um, Peter Rees was really convinced that the tower was a nice add-on, and I think it is, because it gives a kind of transition of a solid block to the sky, uh, which I think is a nice element. But of course, 
uh, some planners thought it was not a good idea, but I think at this moment the planners have some meetings up there in the Sky Pavilion, they see each other there. I think they are quite happy now. <laughs> Was there a plot ratio? I mean, Sorry? Did, did, was there a plot ratio? W w was the tower part of the original volume of the building, or was it, is it an extra space that they've managed to um, add well, on? There, there was no such a thing as a real plot ratio. I mean, um, and maybe there was, and maybe I don't even know. I mean, the client told us we want to have a certain amount of square meters so that we can fit all back together in one building, and we just try to see how we can work on the volume in order to make that to work. Um, but um, as I said, you know, the whole process of getting this building approved is 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 just consult yeah consultation discussion. Uh, it's that level. Um, yeah, it is what it is. But I also have to say the tower was um, also questioned by some of the uh, the people inside the Rothschild organization. They told me many times, you know, this tower, we don't need that for anything. We can just use the cube and that's it. But uh, if you look at it today, we were, of course, absolutely convinced that this would be magnificent and fantastic for the building and we pushed it through. But now, today, you can see they're extremely happy with it because, you know, it's for them an extra they never expected to have. Uh, looking at this picture, the last picture you, you show on the screen right now, and also looking at the, all the, the perspective drawing that you showed before uh, and, and, and the way you, you kind of uh, talked about the relationship between the the, the historical um, memory of the of the bank and the modern space, uh, all this makes a lot uh, make me think about the the you know the way uh, Miss Van der Rohe yeah. was uh, kind of uh, I mean especially in some of his drawings kind of putting putting in relationship the, the you know the the art with with the space of architecture was was Miss a big influence in in the design. Um, yeah, I, I think Mies was an, is, I think Mies has always been an inspiration in our office. But of course, um, yeah, I think, I'm not so sure on the heritage uh, way, but of course it is quite comparable, as you said, because Mies made them these kind of green marble walls and just hit them into a space. Um, yeah, I think it was an inspiration, but maybe at the end I see more relations with him than I would have seen on the way. Um, I was really convinced that it would be extremely nice in a modern building to use, uh, to do things in a large scale, you know, uh, because most interiors of uh, offices, they are just an addition of small scale things like tables and chairs and a small painting, etc. But you never really feel the space. And we, we, f we thought in this building, by doing this kind of large interventions into the interiors, you could really feel the space. And then you see the furniture, and it doesn't become one big, big blur. Thank you, that was very, very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, is there any design process uh, carried from or learned from previous Casa de Musica or Magis Centre to inform this process? Yeah, um, well, I have to say, um, after Casa de Musica, we had, uh, when we got this commission, of course, it became quite <coughs> clear we have to do a bank building, we have to do a headquarter building for a quite prestigious organisation. And it has to look chic, whatever we do. <laughs> um, and I have to say, we had to start uh, from a certain point of view from scratch which was, of course, also exciting. We had to reinvent our palette of materials. We had to reinvent spaces. We had to reinvent lots of things, uh, which is, of course, nice because Casa, Casa de Musica looks like Casa de Musica because it's in Portico. It has a different function. It has different uses. And this is a bank. But as I said, it's, it was starting from scratch. But starting from scratch is quite good for, for an architect because it pushes you to rethink everything 
again. Um, having built fairly non-standard buildings across Europe, how would you say the construction industries in these different places compare? The UK normally gets quite a hard time. Were they up to your standards? Uh, it was very hard, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, and it, it, it got hard to the point where uh, you started doing things that nobody ever used to do, to do it. So as soon as we started working on the heritage, the metal panels with all the, you know, the, uh, the transformation, etc., we had to uh, escape to European companies. So we got material from Spain, Portugal, Germany, uh, Holland uh, to incorporate into the building. Um, because it, 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 in a way, it's logical when you look at it afterwards. Because the problem, of course, in England is that a lot of the small-scale companies disappeared in the Thatcher time. So there's very little hand and crafts work in this country. So I think, um, and if you can find it in this country, it's extremely expensive because it's very rare. So in order to do the all these things that we did and to do it for a reasonable price, because of course we were also confronted with construction <coughs> costs. We had to really go to other countries and we also had to directly source many materials from those companies instead of going to in between companies here and try to get it. But we, I must say we are used to that, you know, I work all of Europe. I know that I know exactly where I get to get my tiles. I go to Portugal when I need my woven mesh. I go to Spain. So for us it was quite normal, but for of course the contractor it was very it was absolutely not normal. <laughs> because we started with the tiles for the bathrooms and uh, I said uh, because they were quite expensive here what I wanted, but I knew in Portugal we could get them a lot cheaper. So I told the contractor, let's get them directly from them. So I called them, can you make these styles? Yeah, no problem. I need this color. Yeah, no problem. And then it started, <laughs> you know. So uh, somehow the the uh, the contractor here tried to call them on the landline, which you cannot do in Portugal because you cannot reach anybody on the landline. It is almost mobile phone. And then they traveled there and they arrived at lunch and they were surprised there was nobody in the factory. <laughs> Um, anyway, so at a certain point, uh, thank God we had uh, a Portuguese colleague who could deal with all the things. But uh, it was a process of getting used to, also for the main contractor we worked with, the both Landlies, you know, we had to go to quite a process. But I think that is the future. I was actually quite surprised that construction here is so isolated. I mean, we are in Europe, you know, <laughs> you need to get, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just really surprised how that can be such an isolated industry and you're just not looking over the boundary. Anyway, but maybe it changes if you think. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Ellen. It's been an absolutely fantastic talk there's been incredible insights and I very much hope that you haven't been disheartened to such an extent that this will be the last realization of your work in this country um, please join me in saying thank you, thank you.